and happy Sabbath to Point Park friends and family. Welcome to our virtual worship experience. Isn't it amazing and mind-boggling that we are already at the end of the first month of the year 2021? God has been faithful and he has been good. Let us pray. Lord, we want to thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for walking with us, for protecting us, and for providing for us every moment of the past 21 days. Thank you for your promises are true and your goodness never fails. May we worship and adore you with every fiber in our bodies. May we be intentional in committing our lives to service for you. Accept our worship today and fill us with a desire to always live for you. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
and Shabbat Shalom. There are a few things we would like for you to remember. It's 2021 and we are back on purpose with God, in God, and for God as we serve and worship Him and lend support to our community. Then every morning, Monday through Friday from 6 a.m. to 6.15 a.m., it's Strength for Today. 15 minutes of prayer and sharing with one another to give us that extra boost we'll need just to make it through the day God is able. Then every Tuesday, it's Power Up Tuesday. From our early morning rising until 12 noon, we are praying and fasting every hour on the hour, interceding on one another's behalf that God will give us the grace, power, and miracles that we stand in need of. And then every Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock p.m. via Zoom, it's Wednesday Connect, one hour of prayer and Bible study. We will complete our lesson answering the question, what does God want on this coming Wednesday? And begin the teaching with Pastor Washington, Deep Faith. You don't want to miss it, and we invite you to come and be with us. All of our church announcements are shared every Friday via email, and we hope and trust that you are receiving them. If not, why don't you give our church office a call and give us your information so that we can be in contact with you and be in connection with one another during this time. We thank you for your attention and governing yourselves accordingly in regards to our church announcements. Well, it's birthdays and anniversary celebration time. And we have several birthdays and we want to lift up those who may have celebrated a wedding anniversary this week. Want to let you know that we miss one. Lloyd Harrod celebrated a birthday on January 11 and we want to say happy birthday to him. Jack Stocks celebrated a birthday also on January 16. And then on Inauguration Day, January 20, both brother William Pitt and sister Gloria Walker celebrated birthdays and we want to say happy birthday to them. And then on January 21, sister Joyce James celebrated another year of life and God bless you, sister James. And then today, my brothers and sisters, our head deacon Clarence Mosley, January 23, is celebrating a birthday and we want to say happy birthday to him and to all and we just want you to know that we love you so much and we're asking that God will continue to pour out his blessings and favor upon you and continue to give you prosperous healthy living amen and now for our wedding anniversary we didn't receive any uh, notifications of, of anyone who's celebrating a wedding anniversary this week but we know that there's somebody somewhere so if you would just mind putting it in the chat for us and even your birthdays if we didn't get those placing them in the chat and we want to say happy anniversary to everyone who has celebrated another miracle of marital bliss and love well, each day this week, we have been praying at 5 o'clock p.m. We experienced a, an inauguration on this past Wednesday, a new president and a new vice president, Kamala uh, Harris. We're so uh, uh, just overjoyed about the history-making moment that took place and to our new president, Joseph Biden. We want to pray for them and our entire country. We're praying also in regards to the pandemic. So we're going to ask that you would join with us one more time today at sunset as the Sabbath begins to slip away and we move into the new week. We want to end it by having this special season of prayer and may you continue to do so from this day forward. Well, it's time now for our children's story, and we invite our young people to come closer and to give their attention and their ears and their eyes to this special message just for them, our children's story. So, um, there's this, there's these two groups of people and they didn't like each other, the Samaritans and another group. was this um, one kid, um, there was this one guy and he was going on a trip with a 
his mule and the donkey has a whole bunch of stuff on it. Um, so this guy was rocking down a deadly robe. And when he looked up um, on the mountain, he saw, was it two? Two people on a mountain. He looked back and his donkey was running away with all his stuff. His horse ran away and so, and some guy hurt him. These robbers or bandits came out and they beat him up. And took all his clothes and he was laying on the ground. Bloody. And he was there um, pretty beat up and this preacher came, a guy who was also going to the temple, and he was like, oh, I should help this guy, but I don't want to help him. I want to go to the temple. Bye. You know, he just walked away. And just people walk by him, don't mind it, and like try to get away from him. The last person, he was a Samaritan, and he helped. He put this medicine on his owies. He he looked at like the paper towel and wiped some it, the blood off. And then after that, when it was night, he took him to uh, like little what was it? A cottage? To a hospital, or what they had back then for a hospital. He took him at a hotel, like an inn, and and the guy stayed there for the night and put him in a bed and just sat there. But then a few minutes later, um, that guy had to leave. Then he pays someone to take care of him, like that guy, and then the other guy just leaves. And said, um, take care of this guy. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pay for his doing. And he made sure that the guy had everything he needed to be able to heal up and be safe. He went away, and then the donkey was safe. When I think of neighbors, neighbors are the people that I right, live right next to on my street. And our neighbors are like people in our neighborhood and that we know, people in our church. I usually think of the people that live around me, but in a way, everybody's your neighbor. People you meet on the street, Everybody. He didn't really mean neighbors. He meant like everybody, even everybody you don't know. Like everybody in the whole entire world. It doesn't matter if they're another color or if they talk a different language. We should just help uh, the people that, that need help or that are suffering from something. Care for people and not ignore them. I love anyone, not just like the people who you know, love like random people who need help. So that we could just be, be just like the Good Samaritan. Happy Sabbath the church family. You know, in the book of Mark, the 12th chapter, it tells a story where Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watch the crowd as they came up to put their money in the temple treasury. You know, many of the rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came up and put in two very small copper coins worthy of just a few cents. Calling his disciples, Jesus said to them, to tell you the truth, this woman has given all that she has, more than the others gave in their abundance. But she, out of the poverty, put in everything that she had. Sometimes, church, the sacrifice speaks louder than the size of the gift. I believe that this woman was having a God moment. She recognized that Jesus had blessed her so much that she had to come and give all that she had. What about you? Are you willing to make that sacrifice? Are you willing to give that others may be blessed? We know that sometimes when we're blessed, we can reach out and allow our blessings to be a blessing to someone else. So let us give so that others around the world can receive a blessing just like you. So at this time, we're just asking that you would give and give to your heart sacrifice. Let us pray. Father God, we come before you thanking you, thanking you once again for blessing us, for allowing us to be able to share our blessings with others. So Father, we ask that you would bless this tithe and this offering that it may go out 
to further your great work. We know that you're coming soon, and we want to be ready, and we want others to be ready too. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. There are several ways you can return your tithes and offerings during this COVID-19 closure. You can give conveniently online through credit or debit card at www.adventistgiving.org. You can also go to the DuPont Park Church website located at www.dupontpark.org. Click the online giving button. Please be sure to create an account or give as a guest. Make sure you select DuPont Park Church as your donation recipient. You can also mail in your giving by sending your checks, money orders, or cashier's checks to DuPont Park Seventh-day Adventist Church, 3985 Massachusetts Avenue Southeast, Washington, D.C., 20019. Attention, DPCTD. Thank you so much for your worship and continued support during the COVID-19 closure. As every occasion to give is an opportunity for us to grow in trusting God, every occasion to pray is an opportunity for us to grow in relationship with God. And, and what a mighty God we serve and how much of a benefit would it be for us to grow in relationship with him. So so let's share our joys and our sorrows with God. We're, we're joyous about the birthdays and joyous about the anniversaries and and joyous about the peaceful transfer of power and joyful about the new year that we are in and, and joyful in particular about the progress that Sister Lula Craig has been making and we still wanna keep her in our prayers. But with our joys, we've got sorrows that need to be shared as well. The sorrows of Sister Annie Lucas, the sorrows of Sister Linda Artis, the sorrows of Sister Carlene Wallace, the sorrows of Sister Valerie Emerson, who, who in particular will be burying her sister this coming Thursday. Then we've got some ailing members among us, Brother James Dixon and Sister Sandra Smith and Sister Susie Watson, among a few to name. And so we've got some things to share with our Lord and Savior, who when we turn to him can bring healing and more joy to our land. So let's seek our Father in prayer. Eternal God, our Father, we are grateful that you are our avenger, God, that you are the one who keeps fighting for us each and every day. God, we're grateful that you are our shepherd, that you keep seeking us out, you keep searching for us, you keep reaching for us. God, we're grateful that you are our way. And God, you can make sense out of the confusion in our lives. You can be the guiding light that beats back the darkness, that you can be our inspiration that gives us the purpose that we need. God, you are our everything. And because you are everything, God, we must give you everything. So God, in this moment, we, we confess our sins. We, we apologize, God, for not acting in a way that is becoming of kingdom dwellers. We, we are apologizing, God, for the words that we have said and the opinions that we might have held and the response we might have given and the thoughts we might have thought and, and the ways we might have acted this week, the ways we might have treated another. God, we apologize. God, we apologize for the things that we know we did wrong and the things that we did not know we do wrong. And God, we pray that you set our feet on the path of righteousness. And in confessing this, God, we pray that you hear our concerns. God, we're concerned about our ailing mothers and our fathers. God, we're concerned about the void and the emptiness that we feel now that our loved one is gone away. God, we, we are concerned about our children. We are concerned about our church. We are concerned about our community. We are concerned about the pandemic. We are concerned about the injustice that is in our neighborhoods and that is in our nation. We are concerned, God, about all these different things. So God, we give these things to you. We know that you don't delight in our concerns. You, you take no joy over them, but you do desire to bring resolution to them. So God, we ask you in the name of Jesus Christ to resolve our concerns, to bring clarity, to bring peace, to restore joy, to 
deal with our concerns and liberate us from the anxiety that is weighing us down. God, we pray, Lord, that you keep us from temptation. We, we pray that you help us to obtain this peace. We pray that you help us to obtain this joy. We help that you help us to be, uh, we pray that you help us to be a little bit kinder, a little bit more generous, a little bit more loving, a little bit more like your son, Jesus Christ, each and every day. God, we ultimately ask that you continue to show us day in and day out that you are not a God who disappoints his children, but that God, you will bring about every good and perfect gift for us. We pray, God, for your manservant, Elder Doggett, today as he brings manna from on high. We pray, God, that it is a filling for us that, that helps us. We pray, God, that the words that you put into him are words that embolden us and empower us and remind us, God, that you are still in control and that you are active and present in each of our individual lives. We pray, God, that you also restore to him what he is pouring out to us. Fill back into your manservant so that he can continue in the service that you called him to. And God, when all is said and done, yea, even now, we give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. This Sabbath is Religious Liberty Ministry Day throughout the North American Division of Seventh Day Adventists. In light of that, we are so happy to have with us today Elder Jackson Michael Doggett Jr. Esquire, who serves currently as the General Counsel and the Public Affairs and Religious Liberty Leader for the Allegheny East Conference. He is no stranger to the DuPont Park family. He has been with us before, and we're happy to have him as our speaker today. We want to say that we are praying for you, Elder Doggett, and to his wife, Celia. God bless you and to their entire family. And I'm inviting the entire family of the church throughout uh, this uh, digital platform that you would pray for the message today, that it will reach and touch hearts, and most of all, transform lives. After we will have been favored with ministry from the DuPont Park Church Praise Team, the next voice you will hear will be that of Elder Jackson Doggett Jr. Esquire, the General Counsel and Public Affairs and Religious Liberty Director of the Allegheny East Conference. Hear ye him in the name of the Lord. <laughs>
Bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. I count it a privilege to be with you today, and I am so thankful for the opportunity to share a word from the Lord. Before I begin, I would like to simply let you know that the Public Affairs and Religious Liberty Department of the Allegheny East Conference has resources for you that you can access at visitaec.org forward slash P-A-R-L. -L. That stands for Public Affairs and Religious Liberty. Visitaec.com forward slash P-A-R-L. The title of my message today is What Happened to the Promise? Let's pray as we begin. Father, as we open your word, I ask the Holy Spirit to be here with us today, teaching us, drawing us, changing us, so that we can be all that you envisioned when you gave us life. I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Our primary text today is found in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. I will be reading from the New Living Translation of the Bible. The Bible says, most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come, mocking the truth and following their own desires. They will say, what happened to the promise 
that Jesus is coming again. From before the times of our ancient ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. Religious liberty is all about freedom of conscience. Freedom of conscience is the God-given right of people to live according to their sincerely held beliefs, whether people agree with our religious convictions or not. Religious liberty is about freedom of conscience. Paul counseled in 1 Corinthians 4, 4, and 5, my conscience is clear, but that doesn't prove I'm right. It is the Lord himself who will examine me and decide. So don't make judgments about anyone ahead of time before the Lord returns. For he will bring our darkest secrets to light and will reveal our private motives. Then God will give to each one whatever praise is due. It's so easy for us to judge others when we come to a conclusion about what is right. But everyone has the right to live according to their conscience before God. And God will ultimately be the judge. Paul further says, 2 Corinthians 1.12, we can say with confidence and a clear conscience that we have lived with a God-given holiness and sincerity in all our dealings. We have de depended on God's grace, not on our own human wisdom. That is how we have conducted ourselves before the world and especially toward you. What he is saying is, you must live according to your conscience. Have a clear conscience. Do what you believe to be right and allow the God-given holiness and not our own human wisdom to determine what is right. I have discovered that churches and church members are very good at wearing a judge's robe especially when someone believes in a manner that is not directly, exactly like we believe. There's a lot I can say about the freedom of conscience and what that concept means in the advancement of the Great Commission. But today I am driven to remind all of us what is really at stake at this time in history. Let's do a quick review. In the year 2020, just last year, it was a trying year for the entire world. There was a global pandemic that shut down countries and plunged millions into poverty due to economic reversals. The Christian churches were caught flat-footed and were exposed as primarily maintenance organizations rather than the disciple-making movement Jesus commanded the church to be. White nationalism, white supremacy, and racial injustice was put on full display. The evidence of two justice systems became undeniable. Political party politics, uncivil discourse, and alternative facts, otherwise known as lies, split this country into the brink of destroying American democracy fueled by leaders who know better. The year ended, however, with hope as vaccines were introduced that might stop the pandemic and return society to some semblance of normalcy. Unfortunately, distribution of vaccine, vaccines stalled under incompetent leadership and more than 400,000 American citizens have died so far. Then there was the presidential election that was won by a candidate with the highest vote count in American history. But the ego of the losing candidate would not allow the acknowledgement of this fact and a campaign of lies, lawsuits, and coercion ensued unabated until late in the evening of January 6, 2021, 
after a historic, seditious insurrection failed and Congress certified the election results. On January 20, 2021, a new president was inaugurated and the hope of a new civil attitude in public discourse began to spread throughout the land. No doubt, with the potential of an effective vaccine and competent leadership to manage America's affairs, the church seems to be hoping to return to what it knew as normal. Unfortunately, normal has meant maintenance and not growth, not consistent soul winning disciple making, and this is not the place where the church should be aspiring to return. But that is exactly where most churches long to return because it's so familiar and comfortable. Jesus himself told the church what he wants. We call it the Great Commission. We find it in Matthew 28, 18 and 20, where Jesus says, I have given been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Notice, the Great Commission is not go therefore and fill up your church buildings or go therefore and make a denominational member. Go therefore and cause people to believe the way you believe. No, Jesus said go and make disciples, meaning his disciples, disciples of Jesus Christ. That is our commission. Now, what is a disciple? That's a very important question because if we don't know what a disciple is, how on earth are we going to be one or make one? So let's look at the scriptures. John 8, 31 and 32 says, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. John 13, 35 says, your love for one another will prove to the world you are my disciples. John 15, 8 says, when you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. So what is the fruit a disciple must produce? Well, you find that in Galatians 5, 22 and 20 to 23. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Notice we don't produce it. We don't manufacture it. A true disciple who has the Holy Spirit will naturally produce this fruit. What is the fruit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Luke 14, 26 to 27 says, if you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else, your father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. Luke 14, 33, so you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. So what is a disciple? A disciple is one who remains faithful to Jesus' teachings, loves everybody, produces the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and put Jesus above everyone and everything. Now, everyone who is a member of a Christian church is not a disciple of Jesus Christ because we just told you what Scripture says a disciple is, is one who remains faithful to Jesus' teachings, loves everybody, 
produces the fruit of the Holy Spirit and puts Jesus above everyone and everything. Peter tells us in 2 Peter 3, 3 to 4, most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come, mocking the truth and following their own desires. They will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? From before the times of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. So despite the prophetic evidence of Daniel chapter 2, where King Nebuchadnezzar was given the dream of the image and God unfolded to the world, to us, to anyone who wants to know how history would unfold and when Jesus would come. Now, it does not give you the exact time, for the Bible says no man knows the hour when Jesus will come. But what we do know is he will come when time goes to the point where that image of feet of clay and, and iron is what just before a stone cut out of the mountain without hands comes and crushes the feet of that image, turns it to powder, and the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. Now, we're in the toes, some preachers say, in the toenails of that image. We're right where not much else has to happen before Jesus comes. Despite the signs Jesus gave in Matthew 24 as evidence that what he said about his soon return is true, despite the warnings of the three angels in Revelation 14, 6 to 11, despite the inevitable outpouring of the wrath of God on the earth in Revelation 16, which is the seven last plagues. Despite all of this prophetic evidence, the proof that the word of God is true, that which we could have confidence in, people still become impatient and allow doubt to creep in because they don't see Jesus coming yet. So that doubt turns to discouragement. Discouragement turns to apostasy. Apostasy turns to selfishness and pleasure seeking. Because people are asking, where is the promise that Jesus is coming again? Verse 5 of 2 Peter 3 says, they forget about the flood that destroyed the earth in the past and about the fire that will destroy the earth in the future. Verses 8 and 9 say, but you must not forget this one thing. Listen, a day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise as some think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. My dear friends, the reason Jesus has not come yet is because he's waiting, perhaps, for you to repent. And if not you, perhaps someone in your family. And if not someone in your family, perhaps someone on your job. And if not someone on your job, perhaps someone in your school. And in Perhaps not someone in your school, perhaps someone in your neighborhood. You get the picture. Jesus is not slow concerning his promise like we might think. After all, for Jesus, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. How can that be? He inhabits eternity. He is not confined to time like we are. So from our perspective, it may look like we have been waiting forever for the Lord to come. And from our perspective, we have. But Jesus is saying, I'm not slow about it. I'm trying to get everybody I can to be ready for my soon return. Nehemiah puts it this way in 931. But in your great mercy, you did not destroy them completely or abandon them forever. What a gracious 
and merciful God you are. Verses 10 and 11 of 2 Peter 3 says, The heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire, and the earth and everything in it will be found to deserve judgment, since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live, looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. Now, how can we hurry the day of the Lord along? Well, by pursuing the Great Commission, making disciples of Jesus Christ. I have to tell you, I'm not so concerned about the day religious persecution becomes commonplace in the United States of America. Sure, we should do what we can to forestall it as long as we can to give space for the pursuit of making disciples. But nothing we do will stop American religious persecution from happening. If you understand Revelation 13 and John 16 too, you understand it's coming. I'm not one of those who feels like we need to keep telling people it's coming because we're not preparing simply for religious persecution. What we're preparing for is an eternal existence in the presence of the God who loved us so much he sent his son to save us from our sins. Our focus should be on our relationship with God that makes us like Enoch. Enoch walked with God and he was so close, God just said, come on up with me. I don't want you to go back home there on the earth. Come on home with me. Now I'm going to make a statement. While church planting is a legitimate church growth strategy, I suggest America does not need more churches. If you go to any major city in the United States, you will see clusters of churches all around the city. Clusters of churches. Do you know the average church in America is less than 100 members? And going forward, it's predicted that a church of 250 members is going to be a large church going forward, particularly because people have become comfortable in going to church from home as opposed to getting up, getting dressed, getting the kids fed, getting them dressed, getting them down the street and finally to the church. It is important that we not look at analog in the building ministry as the only way to do ministry going forward. We don't need more churches. What churches need are more engaged members actively seeking to make disciples of Jesus Christ. The problem is the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. We don't need more church buildings in the city. We need more active disciples who are making disciples. After all, that's what Jesus wants. I believe we are near the day when church growth will more effectively happen outside of the church as an organization and more person to person assisted by digital assets as the church, as an organization, begins to rapidly decline. I'm going to say that again. I think that we are near the day when the church growth will more effectively happen outside of the church as an organization and more person-to-person -person assisted by digital assets as the church as an organization begins to rapidly decline. Now, why would the church rapidly decline? Stubbornly, irrationally attempting to hold on what used to be normal, especially when churches begin to open buildings again and will inevitably give way to what God is doing in a rapidly changing context. What I'm saying is 
The context that we're working is in is rapidly changing. The pandemic forced it on us. And if we try to go back to what we used to do, we will decline. If we move forward in what God is doing now, the church will go forward victorious because people who are disciples will be making disciples person to person, relationship by relationship. In what I call this season, this new season of digital forward, not digital exclusive, but digital forward ministry, churches as organizations and members as individuals must learn to use every tool available to seek to make disciples of Jesus Christ using the only method that really works. Now, tools are one thing. Method is another. And even when we open our church buildings again, we are going to have to recognize there is a huge digital footprint we need to have to reach people. And individual members are going to need to learn how to use these digital assets to be disciple makers, engaging people. It is really ineffective to try to get more people to attend church services, revivals, and crusades, whether they are digital or in the building. Just simply trying to pack people together is no longer going to work. The only thing that's really going to work we knew about a long time ago, oh, that we would simply embrace it. Christ's method alone will bring true success in reaching the people. What is Christ's method is very simple. He mingled with people as one who desired their good, not our agenda, not our bait and switch tactic. We, he mingled with people as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them he ministered to their needs and won their confidence. Not until he mingled with people as one who desired their good, showed his sympathy for them, and ministered to their needs so that he could win their confidence. Not until he achieved winning confidence, which means there was some relationship there. Not until then did Jesus bid them follow him. That is the only method that will bring true success. So everything else, digital assets and et cetera, methodologies, it's, it's a way to pursue the great commission. And if we would do it Jesus' way and understand that our old, comfortable, familiar ways of doing church, so to speak, is no longer what we should pursue, at that point, we'll be able to answer the question, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? Second Peter 3, now, the, the Lord isn't really being slow about his promise. I repeat, as some people think, no, he's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to. To repent. One of my favorite texts in the Old Testament comes from Ezekiel 33, 11. As surely as I live, says the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of wicked people. I only want them to turn from their wicked ways so they can live. Turn, turn from your wickedness, O people of Israel. Why should you die. Jesus reaches out to us through his apostle John in 1 John 1, 9 to say, but if we confess our sins, it's a beautiful thing. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. What I'm saying to you is everybody, regardless of your current condition, has eternal hope. 
Because if you would simply acknowledge and confess your sin, Jesus says, I will be faithful and just to forgive your sin and beyond that, to cleanse you from all wickedness or unrighteousness. Verse 7 says, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Ephesians 2, 5, even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. Verse 8, the one we're familiar with, God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift of God. What am I saying? Religious liberty is about conscience, personal conscience, freedom of conscience, the ability to live in accordance to your sincerely held beliefs. And Paul says, I have a clear conscience. I'm doing all I know to do, but God's the one. Doesn't mean I'm right because I'm doing it that way. God will guide me, but if God will give me his Holy Spirit, my God-given righteousness will lead me to do the right thing. Jesus said, I want you to go and make disciples. That's what I want from you. Stop simply trying to have a big congregation at a certain hour in one day of the week in order to have a wonderful experience together and then go out and live the way you want to live. No, I want you to make disciples. And I explained what disciples were, people who continued in the teachings of Jesus, love everybody, uh, puts God above anyone and anything, bears the fruit of the Holy Spirit. If we would do that, we are developing a relationship with God, and that relationship will, with God will lead us to repentance and then righteous living by his grace. Jesus went to the cross to secure that for us. He died the death that I deserve so I can live the life that he deserves, so that when Jesus comes soon and very soon, I will be able to lift my hands and say, Lo, this is my God. I have waited for him, and he will save me. My appeal to you today is twofold. Number one, become a disciple of Jesus Christ. And number two, get engaged in making disciples of Jesus Christ because Jesus is coming soon. Matthew 24 tells us, Daniel 2 tells us, Revelation 16 tells us, Matthew 24, I said, tells us. All of these texts remind us, Revelation um, 14, 6 to 11, all of these things tell us Jesus is soon to come. I want to be ready, don't you? Don't you? Surely you do. So would you bow your head and pray with me? Father, I am thankful that you have given us all freedom of conscience. But more than that, I am thankful that Jesus came to this earth to set an example for us. And now he is in heaven making intercession for us and has left us a comforter, the Holy Spirit, to guide us in the path that we should go. Now I pray, Lord, that everyone under the sound of my voice would repent of all sin and receive the grace that comes because of the blood of Jesus Christ. I thank you for answering this prayer. And may we move forward to do your great commission so that when you come, you'll be able to say to each one of us, well done good and faithful servant. I thank you for hearing this prayer. And whatever else I should have prayed and did not, Holy Spirit, continue this prayer that God's manifest blessings would rest on us all. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, friends, thank you for the opportunity to share the word of God. God bless you real good. We have been reminded of the importance of living on purpose for God. It is our heart's desire to trust God as he has commanded us. Let us pray. Father, 
thank you for your words of admonition that were given to us today. I pray that we will serve you as a means of drawing us closer in our walk with you. Please be with us throughout the coming week. Dismiss us from this service, but never from your presence. Amen.